have been announcing all week that I wanted to deal with this subject for many reasons, just alone what's sitting in this building. I want to preach on the subject when life doesn't go as planned. I have lived long enough to tell you by experience that I've had things happen to me unexpectedly. And I've also had some areas in my life that I thought had planned out that were disrupted by me, by other people, and sometimes even by God. So what do you do when life doesn't go like you've had it planned out? I want to read one verse in Psalm chapter number 37 and verse number 23. The steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord, and he delighteth in his way. The steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord, and he, the one that God directs his steps, he delights in the way. When I thought about things not working out right in our life, even though we know as a Christian ultimately that all of our footsteps are guided by Jesus if we love him, I think about just some things right here in this building today that has happened that seemingly people didn't have planned in their life. I think about Brother Wally this morning, and I hope Miss Kay, I, I wanted to get with you, and I hope you don't mind me using Brother Wally. Brother Wally was a hard worker all of his life, a carpenter, done his business, made his living for his family, raised his children. And Brother Wally had gotten to the place where he had retired and wanted to enjoy life. And they had moved down here to Tennessee. And in moving here, they wanted to join our church, be a member here, and spend the rest of their life retired, enjoying life, and enjoying God. And in just a few short months, Brother Wally has now been put away in an assisted living facility because of dementia. And now he doesn't even know where he's at. Now, if I were to sit down five years ago and say to Miss Kay, uh, Miss Kay, what, 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 what is your plans? Well, Brother Wally's going to retire. He's been a carpenter. He's worked hard all of his life. All of our kids are raised. We want to be around some of our grandchildren, move down here, try to help us do something with Hollywood to keep him out of jail, if God would permit. She had no idea. No idea. That five years later, her husband would not even know her. How do you plan for that? How do you plan when, 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 the, when there, were, there were couples that come to this church and they were loving and holding hands and they were happy and they had families and they had children and it seemed like they had it all together. And today while I'm preaching in this building, they're divorced. If you would have stopped them two years ago in that back door holding hands, laughing, enjoying each other, if you would have stopped them and said, do you believe in your plans, you could be divorced? They'd have thought you were crazy. Not long ago, there were people sitting in this building that were a picture of health. Healthy, strong, vibrant, energetic, filled with energy. And today, many of them are not even here because they're so sick with diseases and plagues. that They can't even get out of their bed. And today, by thank God for internet, they can sit at home in their illness and at least be fed Somewhat by their pastor. But if you would have sat them down and said, look, you're headed for heavy bodily affliction. They'd have said, well, I feel great. There's nothing wrong with me. Because it wasn't planned that way. I have got people sitting right here today that, that's under this ministry and families that are members of this church. That the that division has slid into several families seated right here in this building. We have got families that can't even not communicate and get along with other members of their own family. But yet everybody's saved, everybody goes to church, everybody loves Jesus, but you can't talk to each other, right? Somewhere down the line, somebody screwed up. But yet, if I would have told you years ago at a family gathering, when you all were playing horseshoes and football and volleyball and laughing and having a good time, if I would have set your family down and said, look, I want you to know in the future, your family's going to have drama, there's going to be division and separation, you're not even going to talk to each other, you would have laughed me to scorn. But today, that's your family. The depression has cast a dark shadow among the people of God. There used to be people that ran the aisles of this church in years gone by when I was here. Ran the aisles of this church. Today they're sitting in a dark room with a handful of prescription pills and hardly even come out to take a shower and go to the bathroom. If I would have set them down 
when they were running the aisle of this church and said, look, I know you're enjoying God, you're having a great time, but I'm here to tell you something. Years from now, you're going to sit in a dark room with a handful of prescriptions. You're going to lock the door. No television, no lights, no family, no communication. You're going to isolate yourself from the world. You would have looked at me and said, are you out of your mind? I love God. I love this church. I love Jesus. But today, while I'm preaching, that is taking place in somebody's life. You don't think depression can attack you? You don't think division can come into your family? You don't think a disease can be in your body? A divorce can enter your home or even dementia invade your mind? I got people sitting here. I'm just using illustrations to show you stuff happens that we don't plan. There's people here plagued with so much doubt that it's surfaced in their life. Uh, they're, they're, they're questioning their faith and they would never tell you publicly, but they're even questioning God. But that was a time when you had total victory. That was a time if we asked for testimonies, you would have been the first one on your feet. That was a time when you carried tracts from the church and passed them out everywhere you went. That was a time on the job when everybody heard you talk about God all the time. But now depression has so robbed you and doubt has sifted every bit of spirituality out of you to where you don't even know if you're saved anymore or not. Did you plan for all that to happen in your life? Absolutely not. And I got families here, good families, godly families, God-fearing families, love this church, love the Bible, love their pastor. But while they're sitting here today, their kids are rebels. Their sons are in prison. Their daughters are on the streets. Their grandkids are dope addicts. I'm talking about their families in shambles. Brother Doug, if I would have set them down when those kids were on their knee and playing at their feet and going on family vacations, if I would have set you down with your family and said, your son's going to prison, your daughter's going to be a prostitute, your daughter's going to be a dope addict, your son's going to be a drunk, in all your wild imaginations, you never planned that to ever happen to you. I've never met a parent in their right mind in my life. That stood up and said, I train my children to be a failure. I train my children to be a disgrace. I wanted my children to be wrapped in ruin. No parent in their right mind would even conceive such an idea. Much less let that be the prayer of their heart. But yet I got good people sitting here. Good people. That cry themselves to sleep every night. Because they don't even know if their daughter's alive or not. They cry themselves to sleep tonight because their grandsons and granddaughters are getting beat in prison by other inmates. Stabbed and choked and raped and there's nothing they can do. Some of you here raised your kids in the house of God. And this Sunday morning while you're sitting here with a Bible in your lap and Jesus in your heart. Your kids are so low down and sorry and lazy. They're still wallowing around in bed. And could even care less if their mom and dad ever attended church anymore. I say no parent ever planned that to happen. With their children. But yet it happens. And the list can go on and on and on. But I'm trying to show you these problems are real. They exist. They affect us. So my question is not if plans are going to get disrupted. They are. I want to know what I'm supposed to do when it does. Oh, you may be sitting here today and think you got it all under control. Maybe your life has been a cloud of ease. Hang on, Jack. You're not dead yet. You will face the same decisions we have faced when we throw up our hands and say, what in the world is going on in my life? When these things happen, it's not a question of if it will, but when these things, when these plans, when the unexpected, when the abnormal, when the unthinkable happens... You've got to be careful. There's three dangers that we all have to deal with when we face our plans being changed unexpectedly. Number one, sometimes people get stuck where that change, that unplanned decision takes place. They get stuck there. They refuse to allow life to give them a fresh breath of air and a chance to live again. They feel like they're obligated to be stuck in that situation that's devastated them. They feel like if they go, go on beyond that devastation, they feel guilty. 
They feel like they have forsaken something or somebody. They feel like it's an act of disrespect because they don't go on with their life. Let me use death as an illustration. What are you going to do, ladies, when you roll over one morning to kiss your husband and he's cold? And he's stiff. And you find out you slept with a dead man all night. There are women that are so stuck on that experience. They're right there and they cannot and they will not get beyond it. My mother rejuvenated her life and lived 18 and a half years after my dad. She never got over it. I don't think you're supposed to. I don't think it's, it would be abnormal to say you get over it. You just learn to live with it. But I asked her, I said, mom, you seem so strong. I mean, brother, she just buckled down and stepped up and kept being mom. And she, I said, mom, what has helped you through? You, you did not get stuck. She was on her way to pick my dad up from the hospital. The doctors had already signed his release. And they walk in the room and he's had a massive heart attack and he's laying there dead. Doctor had already seen him that morning. She said, son, what kept me from getting stuck and wasting the rest of my life on your dad's death was this. I realized the day that I found my husband dead, there were also millions of other women across the face of the earth that found their husbands dead as well. I wasn't the only one that it happened to. For 6,000 years since the fall of man, women have been burying their husband. And somehow they find the strength and the grace to pick up what's left and go on and to live their life. You can't get stuck because something happened in your life that don't plan. My kids went bad. I'm sorry, but you can't get stuck there. I've had cancer. I'm sorry, but you can't get stuck there. There's drama in my family. I'm sorry, but you can't get stuck there. You've got to go on with your life there's a danger of getting stuck second of all I want to warn you of the danger of getting sour I want to talk about bitterness as a result of thinking let me tell you what bitterness is bitterness is because you think you know what's best for your life better than God did and because God did what he knows is best for your life you're bitter because it's not according to your plan you can be bitter at God and really not even know it you can have a bad spirit and not even know it. It was Jesus that told his disciples, ye know not what manner of spirit ye are of. you got to be careful not to let an event make you sour and bitter. I was in Georgia last week and a woman came up to me at the end of the meeting and she started crying. And she's a godly, precious, silver-haired lady. I love her. She loves me. She came up to me after the last night of the meeting, uh, Thursday night of this week. And she said, I would like to speak to you for a moment. And I said, sure. And so I met her over in a fellowship hall. And she said, preacher, not long ago, I found my husband dead. And she said, because God let him die like that alone. And I found him like that. I, I just didn't feel like I could sit in church without him. Because we'd sat there for so many years together. So she said, I, I just quit church. And she said, it wasn't long till I, I, I said, how can I talk to a God that took my husband and he was alone. So she said, I quit praying. She said, how could I read a Bible written by a God that's left me here alone? So I quit reading. And she said, I had even got to the point. I mean, a precious lady. She said, I had gotten to the point, brother kid, where I didn't even know if I was saved and I didn't even care. Because I got bitter. But she said, this week I realized my husband didn't die alone. He was a child of God. I may not have been there, but I know the Lord was there for my husband. He's safe in the arms of Jesus. And I want you to know, I got victory over being bitter in my life. You have to be careful that you don't get stuck in it. You got to be careful that you, that you don't get sour in it. Many times. These feelings affect those that love us the most. We get bitter and mean and hateful and vindictive at people that love us the most. Because if you're hurt and you don't know how to respond properly, you will automatically hurt other people. And it'll be the people that want to love you and be with you and comfort you and be there for you the most. And if you're not careful, you're chasing away the very people that you need in your life the most. You need them. You can't let something happen that's unplanned make you get stuck. You can't make it make you sour. And I'm reluctant to mention this one, but it's biblical and I must. 
If you're not careful, it can make you suicidal. Even Bible illustrations that I could give you from the Old Testament and the New. Men felt like the only way to get relief from their disrupted plan was to end their life. May I say to you, suicide has never solved the problem. It only compounds the hurt, the pain, and the confusion. And sometimes we can get so out of our goals, so out of our vision, so out of our dreams and plans. And the way God has directed us and his way that he's putting us on is so counterproductive to what we had planned out. That we think death would be a blessing to get us out of the confusion, the hurt, and the despair that we're living in. Suicide has never been an answer or a solution to a problem. God never promised never to put any more on you than you're able to bear. If I only lived for God because everything in my life was worked out, I'd close my Bible, walk out of this church, and you'd never see me again. But I've chosen to live for him no matter what does or what doesn't work out. He's still God. He's never made a mistake, and he knows what's best for you and I. That doesn't mean I always like it. Doesn't mean I always agree with it. But I found out in 42 years of being a Christian, God has never asked my opinion about anything. Sometimes I've offered it without his request, and I'm still waiting on an answer. So what do you do when things doesn't work out? You're going to get stuck in it. You're going to get sour and bitter. You're going to get suicidal. Say, I'll just leave on, go my way. One old timer said this. Life consists of 10% of experiences and 90% attitude. I wish I could tell you as your pastor that I could wave a magic wand and make these things go away and it never happened to you. But in reality, I'd be a false prophet in doing so. So it is my calling to equip you for when these things do happen. What do you do when life doesn't go as planned? Probably between now and this time next month, some of you sitting right here and some listening around the world, this very reality, even me, will happen in our lives. What are we going to do with it? Let me go back to verse 23. I want to show you four words that I want to pick from this verse. Number one, the word steps. Number two, it's two words, good man. Number three, I want you to look at the word ordered. And number three, look at the word delighteth. Those are going to be my four points that I want to talk to you on what do you do when life doesn't go like you planned it. Number one, don't let up. Notice what he said in verse 23, the steps, plural. Do you see that? That implies to me, Brother Chad, that this gentleman that's, or lady that's going through, evidently it's a deviation from their plans because God had to remind them that he had an order for them. So evidently there was something going on that they didn't understand. But notice the word step is plural, which shows me there's motivation and there's movement. In other words, here's what this person's saying. There may be something that has come in my life that I didn't plan or maybe I wasn't even ready for, but I just want to serve notice on the devil. If you're coming after me, you better get your running shoes on because I'm not stopping and laying down just because there's an area of my life that I can't figure out and I can't put my finger on and I can't explain. I just want the devil to know I'm not stopping anything. You don't let up. You know what I found out from people that shoot all the time? A moving target is the hardest one to hit. If the devil comes after me, bless God, he better have his scope tuned in because he's going to be coming after a moving target. This plural word means that you are going to take another step. Notice it said the steps of a good man. You know what that means? When the devil comes to you and says, this is going to be your last step. All you got to do is read verse 23 to him and say, you're a liar. The Bible said the steps. That means I'm going to live long enough to take another step. I'm going to live long enough to take another step. I'm going to live long enough to take another step. I'm going to live long enough to take another step. The steps of a good man are order of the Lord. You know what that means? That means we're motivated. That means we're energetic. That means we keep going on. You say, oh, the devil's done told me this is going to take me down and shipwreck me. And I'm going to be nothing but a ruin the rest of my life. Yeah? Well, let's check his batting average. That dirty, egg-sucking, cross-nosed, pug nose, foaming at the mouth, good for nothing. He said that about you last year. And you're still here. And you still love God. And the Lord has still been good to you. He's supplied every need. He's brought us through every trial. When are you going to learn? The devil is nothing but a bald-faced liar. A moving target, you must go on. When you quit moving, when you quit growing, when you lose 
all your validity to get closer to God, now you're going to get in trouble. Now you're going to falter and you're going to fail. Watch this. I'll give it to you. You know what the Bible said about Adam before he sinned in the garden? He lived in a place called paradise. Son, did Adam have it made? God, did he have it made? No sin. No children. Think about it. Walked with God every day. Adam didn't even have to have a belly button. You ever thought of that? You think about that. Adam wasn't born. Hollywood, you ever thought about that? Adam didn't even have to have a belly button. Didn't have a chicken pox scar. And think about this. You don't think he lived in paradise? He had the privilege of having a wife without a mother-in-law. David. Now, if that ain't heaven on earth, I don't know what is. Mine just came to spend a week with us. She stayed a week. I had a physical. She's 84 and in better shape than I am. I don't think the old hag will ever die, but. And here's what the Bible said. The Bible said that Adam walked with God in the cool of the day. Now watch this, Dustin. As long as he's walking with God, he's in fellowship with God. Am I right? Everything's good. We're in perfect fellowship. There's no sin. Everything's perfect because he's walking with God. But when he stopped walking and he started listening, now he falls into sin. Notice the Bible didn't say Adam was walking when he partook of that fruit. He stopped walking with God and started listening to the enemy. And see, that's why it's so important to stay motivated. You don't let up. You just keep walking with God. But something's happened that I don't understand. Keep walking. But it hurts. Keep walking. I don't have the answers. Keep walking. I feel forsaken. Keep walking. When I pray, it seems like nothing. Keep walking. The Bible's nothing. Keep walking. I can't find God. Keep walking. And somewhere down the road, the sun will shine again. You don't let up. I'm following Jesus. I don't have time to listen to your junk. Here's what the Bible said. Walk in the light as he is in the light. And we have fellowship one with another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, God's son, cleanses us from all sin. How do you stay cleansed from all sin? You walk. You exercise your relationship with God. You don't let up because something happens that you don't understand. Sure, it hurts to the point where you feel handicapped. I've been there and you have too. There's been times I didn't know if I'd ever see the sun shine again in my life. But through time and walking with God, it happens. You remember when Jacob wrestled with the Lord all night long in the book of Genesis. And the Bible said when he got up the next day, his, his thigh was pulled out. His hip was totally dislocated. And, uh, and the shrunk of his leg was deformed and twisted where he fought with the angel all night long. And the Bible said, Brother Mark, when the sun come up the next morning, Jacob was walking. Now, that doesn't mean it felt good. That doesn't mean he understood it. And it doesn't mean it's what he wanted. But here's what he said. I may have one area out of my life that's out of joint. But the rest of my life is in unity. And by God, I'm not letting one thing get me down. I may come limping. But I tell you what, God, I'm going to keep on walking. I might be handicapped. It's my God in the morning. I may not understand it. And I may not feel good. But I'm going to keep on walking. Keep on walking. Keep on walking. Thank God in the morning. You don't let up. Even if it hurts, you keep walking. You don't let up. Number two, notice the second thing I talked about was a good man. You see that in the verse? You don't leave God. The word good man means somebody that's upright, righteous, dedicated, clean living. I don't understand why people run from God when things unexpectedly happen. You think it would cause his children to run to him. Direct your frustrations and your anger to the one that's responsible. You know, growing up, I was the baby of five children. And uh, I've suffered all the ridicule about being the baby and how you get by with stuff and uh, that all the other kids got whipped for. I've heard of How many of you are the baby of your family? Aren't you tired of hearing that stupid stuff? They're just jealous. It's not that we got less whippings because our mom and dad loved us more. It's just by the time we come along, they were so tired of beating kids that they didn't care. They just didn't care anymore. 
But one thing that always griped me was siblings. And some of them are watching today, and this is part of my bitterness, is when something would happen and dad would come in and say, all right, I'm going to whip both of you. You ever had that happen? There's a fight, something gets broke. Who did it? Not me. Goes to everybody else. Who did it? Not me. All right. I'll whip all of you. Nothing burned me up anymore than to get whipped for something I didn't do. I got blamed for something I didn't do. I got chewed out for something I didn't do. Then you get your tail beat. And you didn't even do it. But yet you get accused of it and you got to pay for it. See, that's how I'm sure God feels sometimes. When our plans are disrupted, we start blaming God. We start indicting God. God ain't never been nothing but good to you. If you're going to have frustration and anger and blame, put it on the low-down devil. He's the one that's caused every bit of it anyhow. And leave God out of it. Don't leave God. I'm going to ask you a question. Show me one person in your life that's ever left God and their situation got better. I can show you many that left God and it didn't get better. It got worse. Brother Adams, I want to close with this. I'm out of time. Man, have I enjoyed preaching this to you today. I want to close with this. God has been so good to me that even if he tried to leave me, I'd track him down. I know a good thing when I got it. I'm not going anywhere. This is the best I've ever had. He might as well get used to me. I want to close with this. I had a preacher friend that had a dog. It was called, uh, the name of the breed is called Chow Chow. Now that ought to tell you something right there. To me, that's too close to being Choo Choo. And any dog that'll Choo Choo you, you need to kill it. Or dispose of it, I should say. He had a dog that was a Chow. Let me tell you something about a full-blooded Chow. Its tongue is purple. Purple! You do not have to be a rocket scientist to know that if a dog's got a purple tongue, it's got a demon in it. <laughs> and he got to the point where he couldn't take care of it. We'll have to edit this, Brother John, because I'm going a little over. So he, he gave it to a lady seven miles on the other side of town. He'd love that dog. He'd been good to that dog, but he just felt like it's time for it to go. And he gave it to a woman seven miles on the other side of town take care of it he got up the next morning got a cup of coffee him and his wife went out sat on the front porch and there was that dog standing in the front yard looking at him he said that how did that dog get seven miles back home he called a lady said lady your dog's missing she said i'm looking all over the neighborhood with a leash he said it's seven miles away it's in my front yard she said he must have jumped the fence she got it took it back built the fence up higher he said him and his wife got up the next day got a cup of coffee went out sat on the porch and there sat that dog again Seven miles it had found its way back twice.